Hi, welcome to our first virtual talk of Plants, People and Places, which is our new project on medieval castles and modern landscapes, which features relict plants. Me, I'm Karen Dempsey, and this is uh, working in partnership with Dr. Fiona McGowan. We're going to take you through some of um, the background to our study, some medieval castles, some gardens, and then talk about our project a little bit more and some of our case sites. So this is, of course, a talk in conjunction with Heritage Week, and we are thinking green about medieval castles. Now, I might have to remind you that medieval castles are not just about warfare. People lived in them. They were residences. And so castles had gardens. These, of course, could be places of rest, play and display as well as productive centres for at least some of the food to supply the castle's household. Gardens also provided some of the curative and medicinal plants that medieval people used. In the Middle Ages, plants were really valued for their culinary fragrant and medicinal properties, and they were also considered to have mental and spiritual benefits. So, like if you enjoy sitting in your garden looking at the sunset or admiring the, the bees on your flowers, you understand what this side of contemplation means. It's a sort of meditative quality that comes from being in a green space. So what then did, did they look like? What did medieval gardens look like? Well, we know there's mentions of gardens. Medieval historians have noted reference to bowers, these arched trellises covered with vines or climbing plants. And we know there was possible water features too, which have shown up in some excavations. Things like hawthorn hedging, roses and juniper trees are also mentioned. Medieval manuscripts like the one you see here show these luxurious images of trellising and water features in this sort of verdant green dreamland. Now these have really religious overtones, so I'm not going to suggest that these were exact replicas or these mythical gardens actually existed in real life. But I think it's important to imagine we can use these as a potential reference point. Surviving architecture at these places indicates that some were enclosed with relatively high walls, often surmounted by a parapet and crenellations, which are the little up and down bits that you see on top of castle walls. Excavations too tell us something about what plants were grown at the castle, but there's no certainty as to what exactly was growing in the medieval garden. It's more a general understanding of what was consumed at the castle. So we know what gardens might have looked like and some of the things that were present there. But what do we know about gardening itself? Well, I don't know any examples from Ireland, but certain examples, such as at Richmond in Yorkshire, has a latrine that empties directly into the garden space. So were medieval people good at composting? But what else did they do? How did they know how to grow plants? How did plants come to be in different places? Well, we know nurseries were established at monasteries, there is even one in Kilmainham by the 14th century. Potentially that they also existed at castles. How can we find out more about the plant life of medieval castles and the green spaces that must have been present and whether these are formal gardens or, <clears throat> or more rough spaces? Is there another way? So then we turn to relict plants. Can we look at the modern landscape in a different way, as a way to give clues about the medieval plant life? The study of relic plants involves the examination of modern landscapes for the presence of plants that may have survived from or been used during the medieval period. This means that plants survive that were deliberately planted, curated and cared for by medieval people living at the castle. In a recent study, Fiona, my project partner, Dr. Fiona McGowan, identified two really interesting plants at Lee Castle. One 
was yellow wallflowers, which we've just seen in the previous photo. And these were planted, these are non-native to Ireland, imported from the Medi Mediterranean region, and they're believed to waft good smells in the castle window. And they have these bright yellow flowers that frame the window and kind of create a spectacle that we associate with the display of lordly power and wealth and hospitality. And they must have made such an eye-catching marker in the landscape. If that wasn't enough, Fiona isn't the only one who has this good idea. Anne Connolly did a survey of Welsh monastic and castle complexes and she saw that there were clusters of plants with known medicinal uses present at castle sites but notably absent from suitable surrounding terrain. There is a large number of medicinal plants here but interesting ones are wild sage, wild rocket as well as henbane and they show up in so many different medieval medicinal recipes um, across Ireland and Britain and indeed Europe as well. Relic plant studies is a pioneering field and it's something that's going to keep growing and growing as, as we all start to begin turning towards thinking green. Dr Sinnott from the National Botanical Gardens also noted this back in the 1970s and he identified an, a series of plants that occurred at Accord, occurred more regularly at Norman castles and abbeys in Ireland and he believed that whether these had been imported by the Normans or whether they their medicinal qualities were recognised and they started to be curated at the castles and so we kind of used these as um, ways into understanding medicinal plants at castles. So that brings us then to the actual project, which is sowing seeds of interdisciplinary work. Me, a medieval archaeologist, and Fiona, an ecologist. We put our heads together and decided that we thought that the study of relic plants deserved further attention. We want to build on the work already done and understand if there's surviving plants at medieval castles, which were possibly planted, grown, cared for and used by medieval people to further inform us of the medieval lived experience in the garden and also perhaps even understanding gardening further. Ecological surveys are going to be carried out at four geographically distant but culturally similar, they were of the same period and the same sort of people lived in them basically, um, castle sites across Ireland. These also have diverse landscapes and you can see it's Adair County Limerick, Castle Roach County Louth, Castle Cara, County Mayo and Carberry County Kildare. I'll have to say I have an affinity with Carberry, I'm a Kildare woman myself and um, I actually did my master's thesis on it many years ago now. Uh, from these selected sites, only a dare has been subject to archaeological investigation and therefore it has an archaeobotanical report which we can analyse. Castle Cara is surrounded by woodland which has the potential to be ancient and the Loch Mask and Loch Cara Special Area of Conservation Areas are there, um, which we are also including in part of our survey. All four have associated settlements and a variety of religious houses from parish churches to abbeys and friaries. <clears throat> Castle Cairo um, is particularly interesting because it has quite an undisturbed landscape and as you'll see as we go through the talk and the other videos which you're going to have a tour of, um, it, they're all quite interesting places. So this, um, this next part is a series of guided tours interspersed with uh, some of the early results of our ecological surveys. Myself and Fiona, who both of us have a passion for ecology and the medieval, have been carrying out ecological sur surveys over the summer. They were meant to happen, but you know yourself, COVID. Once we've compiled all these ecological reports and integrated them with the archaeology, we're hoping to have a better idea of the sort of plants that were grown and used at medieval castles by contextualising the results within appropriate historic and folkloric traditions. Altogether, we're going to analyse these with the archaeological, historical and architectural details of the four castles. So you can see why we're sowing seeds of interdisciplinary work. Um, and I think we hope together that this is going to really demonstrate the value of 
relict plant studies and our hope to understand the green lives of people in the past. So, uh, good morning everybody. This is Castle Roach, County Loud, and it's the first day of our uh, sowing seeds, relict plants um, uh, study and very excited as to seeing what treasures that Castle Roach hold. So these are only a selection of the plants that we found growing at the castle and milk thistle is particularly interesting because it is quite rare in, rare in Ireland um, and it was used uh, to help lactating mothers to bring their milk in and um, for a, a lot of other curative properties. Mallow too is something that we find at medieval castles and this was used as a poultice and pelletry of the wall, which you're going to see quite a lot of over the next couple of, of um, slides because it's found at nearly every single medieval castle and also church and abbey that we looked at. Um, I don't know if that's if it's of interest that it's a cure for it's a folk cure for baldness and perhaps that's why it was growing everywhere. Um, no, I, I just. So, good morning, Castle Studies. Here we are in Adair Castle, County Limerick. Um, the first castle built here was probably by Donal Moore O'Brien, who built the medieval hall. But the big masonry structure you see behind me was likely built by Geoffrey de Marisco and his wife Eve de Birmingham. This is the second day of our relic plant survey and I'm hoping that the castle is going to yield some really nice plants like the milk thistle we found up at Castle Roach the last day. Though the OPW have been here and it's incredibly well conserved and the very very ordered so I'm not too sure if, um, if we're going to be as lucky but there's, there's lots to do and see anyway. So I found a less windy place to make the next video. From here you see the River Meg to the left and the bridge crossing it. This river is tidal and from about 200 metres up from the castle so it could have been used as a way to transport people and things. In front of me to the left is the later hall, the 13th century hall and I'm standing in the services area. Here you can see the focal building <laughs> and this is the main private residence space um, of the Lord and Lady, of possibly even Joffrey. And the large green space here with the two yew trees. Unfortunately, these are not medieval. Yes, they're, they're um, probably planted by Lord Dunraven in the 18th century. I'm standing at the high end of the medieval hall, that which would have been occupied the Lord and Lady in their house. This is a mid 12th century aisled hall and you can see the big post pads there that would have divided this space. In front are the buttery and pantry which would have held the dry and wet goods of the house. So like butter and beer but also tableware and table napkins. And beyond that the large central opening there leads to the medieval kitchen or at least a kitchen anyway. Um, and to the right here we have these beautiful twin light windows which overlook the river Meg. These would potentially have held stained glass and you can see these window seats and we can imagine people sitting here perhaps whispering overlooking the, the river um, or playing a game. And beyond that in the green space was likely the medieval village of Adair and there has been some um, recent finds such as the outer enclosure, enclosure of the town as well as some burgage plots. So, an interesting site with more, more to tell us. Adair was a really interesting site because the landscape is quite conserved by the OPW and we didn't find that much at the castle itself other than some angelica in the moat and also pelletry of the wall of course. But once we went outside and we walked along the riverbank directly beside the castle we found some um, tucked on some cell fields, some Dyer's Rocket, and we walked over to the, the medieval 
monastery, the monastic complex, the religious house there, and we found a, a great deal of stuff, including um, Great Mullane, which was widely used for chess complaints. And this is also found at other monastic complexes, such as Kells Priory, as was noted in Angelisa Steets in about 2000 in Archaeology Ireland. So relic plants have a long tradition. And Carberry Castle is located is a very rich archaeological landscape with monuments from the prehistoric period, um, including ring barrows and Iron Age inhumations. But we're interested in the medieval aspects, which include the later medieval aspects, which included graveyards plus church and, of course, the moss and successive castle buildings. And you can see here on this aerial image that there are so many different earthwork features. There is a later garden and um, enclosures related to the Elizabethan castle, but of course these could be earlier. Now we're just going to move through the landscape and up into the castle. At this point we're inside the large masonry castle and you can see there's quite tumble down and a lot of debris, but still some plants are surviving in here and we have normal thistle, not milk thistle, um, as well as hemlock and also our old friend pelletry of the wall but here it's found a safe space and it's incredibly um, proliferous and very green and broad leafed. So I'm standing here on the northern edge of the oldest part of the castle which was this large masonry chamber block um, these vaults here are insertions of the 13th century, probably maybe 13, maybe even as late as 1300. And you can see the wonderful arcaded spine wall here and also here. We're going to walk through underneath the vault um, so that I can show you the really large beam, beam holes that would have once held the the timbers for the floor and these are incredibly large. I'm up on top of the moss which is the earliest earth and timber part of the castle and behind me is the multi-period castle which looks quite like a quite quite a small site but uh, in fact as you have seen in the other videos it's really expansive. I'm standing in the middle of the the flat top of the the original moss and the views around the countryside as you can see are are incredible. To the rear of the moss is, is one of the quarries that was used to quarry the limestone. Up on this hill behind me there are a number of early medieval and potentially some Bronze Age ones as well. So this is the quarry um, that was li most likely used for the, the limestone to build the castle. Um, it's, a, it's a black limestone and it's quite different from the others in the area in, by virtue of its colour. So the moss is to the rear of this and you can just see a tiny, tiny bit of masonry walling which encircles the, the, the very first moss built by Myler Fitz, Fitz Tenry. So we've seen the many different ways in which Carberry is an interesting site. There were no standout plants that made this site ultra remarkable but present were so many of the common ones we do associate with medieval diet and medicinal practice, from ladies' bed straw to meadowsweet, woundwort, self-heal and comfrey, as well as the henbane 
we found inside the castle. So I think that this site is going to really add to our knowledge of medieval green lives. I'm definitely biased, um, but Carberry, I think, is a really special place. And we walked throughout the landscape and, and examined the castle, but we also took a journey around the outer perimeter of the the along the road and we found a really amazing abundance of healing plants from comfrey and of course we found pelletry of the wall at the castle meadow sweet and woundwort um, and this is just a handful of the ones from the road verge which which seems to be um at least bounding some parts of the the castle complex Hi Castle Studies, as promised, uh, so continues the video diary of our Relict Plants project. Um, I'm here today at Burzkar Abbey and Castle, and the two are located a little bit separate from each other. The Abbey, uh, the parish church in the Ville, the, it's a deserted medieval village, and that's located about one kilometre <coughs> from Castle Cara, both of which are situated on Loch Cara, the only, one of the only moral lakes in Western Europe. and we're hoping to have a really good survey today because Castle Car Woodland is a special area of conservation and we think that there's some ancient <coughs> woodland still there. Um, I'm really hopeful and as always, and uh, I'm delighted to be outside on such a beautiful day. Uh, you can see why I might be happy doing some field work today given that the, <laughs> the other days were so terrible. But uh, this is the image of the abbey here behind me. <clears throat> and I'm just going to rotate. This is still a modern graveyard, it's an active graveyard as well. And behind me here is the parish church. So here we are at Castle Cara, and um, you can see behind me this really large masonry castle. And this is the, the main focal building, it's a chamber. Um, over two floors and has a really large protruding latrine that I'll show you. And behind me here is a building which I think is probably a, a later medieval hall style building um, that might have replaced a wooden structure. Right behind me here you can see a, a large doorway and it has a, a bridge and you can see the piers as I move the photo move the camera so one pier here and one pier there and so probably a wooden bridge would have come out um, underneath the doorway and I'll show you a picture of the lake in a second so you can think about what it would have been like to see someone coming out of there but also to be the person who gets to walk across that bridge and look out across over the lake. So this is the lake behind me and Castle Cara is situated on a, a slight promontory um, and this is a marl lake, as I was saying earlier, so it's incredibly rare. And I'm going to tag somebody, uh, the Loch Cara Catchment Area Project. Um, and they have a really interesting website all about the lake and history ecology that I think you'll find uh, really, really interesting. You can see here possibly that there's a natural harbour because there's a shelf life, shelf like um, limestone plateau there, and then it goes out into deeper water. Walking back from the castle along the lake shore, you can see this um i suppose in a way it's a kind of a paved surface but it's hard to know what when this dates to because there's you know a 16th 17th century house here as well but um or whether it's a uh, bedrock that also functions as a path it's interesting nonetheless especially when you take into account here all the quarry and i suppose this is where that uh, they found the they took the, the limestone for the building of the castle. And so what did Castle Cara reveal in terms of plant life? Well, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. From yarrow and wood sorrel to meadow sweet, ladies bed straw, buckthorn, it, it really had a host of things that we hadn't um, encountered at, at the other places, I suppose owing to this this uh, wooded landscape as well. Wood sorrel is often thought to be, uh, is confused with the true shamrock. And yarrow is, is, is a medieval medicinal plant that occurs widely from manuscripts and folklore. Um, Meadowsweet is, is, still a, is still a beautiful herb, 
plant and you crunch it up and put it in your pocket and it smells very sweet indeed but it it's very interesting because it is one of the plants that contains natural aspirin and so people were using were treating people this with years and it wasn't until the, the 1860s that they realized the potential of this plant to be used and hence we have aspirin i don't think i need to talk too much about what purging buckthorn is but let me say i wouldn't advise eating it so in in all of this, we've come to the end of our journey through our castles and our plants. And let me say that this is still a work in progress. We've only started condu finished conducting the field work. And so we're working through our notes um, to come up with how we can integrate the ecology and the archaeology together. But one thing I didn't mention throughout all of this was the demands of the plants and flowers themselves. Plants want to reproduce, plants want to move, they want to locomote. And so we shouldn't be too surprised that they still crop up or they still move or they act upon us with their beauty or their ability to turn into woven objects or baskets or anything. They're inherently useful. And like the medieval people, they are good for us. They are good for our green lives to contemplate on, to meditate in and to admire. So thank you for looking at or listening to uh, our heritage talk and you can read more about it on the Castle Studies blog which I will link to and we hope to be back with another update and um, soon enough I suppose. <laughs>